So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 17th of July, uh, 2013, and we have Troy Hicks with us for the second week in a row. Welcome, Troy, along with a couple of um, people who he uh, talks about in his new book, uh, Crafting Digital Writing. Um, and so we have Aaron Klein and Andrew Schorenborn. Is that close, Andy? Close enough. <laughs> Close enough. Uh, when you, uh, how do you say it? Go ahead. Sh Shinborn. Shinborn. That's not close at all. I'm sorry. Yeah, I wasn't okay. <laughs> Thank you for getting me there. So, um, and Troy's going to open up with some conversation about um, about crafting writing in various ways. He will explain that in just one second. But Troy, do you want to? Um, introduce our guests a little bit more first, or have them introduce themselves a little bit more, and then uh, launch in, and we'll see what happens. Um, joining us later will be Beth, uh, what's your last name? Nelson. Beth Nelson as well. Mm -hmm. So, and there's room here if you want to join us in the uh, Hangout and, uh, and mess us all up, or it doesn't mess us all up at all, but come interrupt us right in the middle of our conversation. We'd love to have you. So if you do want to and you're hearing this somewhere, you can find the link to join us in this room at edtechtalk.com slash ttt. And there's also a chat that will probably be going on there um, while this broadcast is going on. So over to you for a little bit, Troy. And then we'll, as you know, I will interrupt you when I want to. <laughs> Quite all right. Not okay. a problem. Um, yeah, there's already a few people showing up in the chat room. Uh, hi, Peggy, and it looked like Anna was there that I knew would show up, and a few other people who I don't know. So glad to uh, see you in the chat room, and please join in if you'd like. So I'll um, quickly reintroduce myself. I'm Troy Hicks. I'm an associate professor of English at Central Michigan University, and I also direct the Chippewa River Writing Project, which is where I met Andy and Beth. And I'll quickly introduce Beth, even though she won't be here for a few minutes. Um, she's a teacher at Greenville High School in Michigan and uh, participated in our summer institute, I think, in 2009, and is also very involved in the Michigan Reading Association. And so she teaches English at Greenville High School. And then I'll pass it over to Andy to let him introduce himself and then Aaron. Hi, I'm Andy Schimborn. I teach uh, high school at Mount Pleasant High School in Michigan. Um, I've been teaching now for 11 years, and I first got involved with Troy through a Chippewa River Writing Project back in 2010. And uh, since then, I've been employing a lot of different uh, digital literacy techniques in my classes with uh, some great success. I was a, a member of um, this program last week as a, as a participant, and this week I'll be joining you and talking a little bit about what I do in my classroom. Welcome. Thanks. Hi, Erin. Hi, I'm Erin Klein. I currently teach second grade. I'm in the Bloomfield Hills area in Michigan as well. I've taught uh, first grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, and then now I'm back in the elementary at second grade. Uh, Troy and I connected through the Eastern Michigan Writing Project. He kind of got me started with the writing project, and since that was closest to my area, that's where I started. So we've kind of collaborated on a few projects throughout the year, so I'm excited to be here tonight and talk with all of you. All right. Thanks. And both Andy and Aaron are going to talk specifically about how they help their students create um, presentations, um, crafting presentations with tools other than PowerPoint, so moving beyond the traditional norm. And then Beth will talk a little bit about um, how she worked with her students to create digital essays using wikis and Google Docs. So I'll be really brief, um, given a quick intro here. I'll throw a couple links into the chat room. But um, the idea for the book, the main kind of uh, point that I wanted to build on is this rich history that we've had um, in studying author's craft over the last probably 30 years or so, going back to the work of Don Gray, and moving forward with Lucy Calkins and Nancy Atwell and Katie Woodray, Barry Lane, Ralph Fletcher, Penny Kittle. I'm sure I'm forgetting some names here. I apologize. But just a whole history of people that have been looking at author's craft. Well, what I wanted to do was take that notion of author's craft and just kind of encapsulate it, summarize it. And so... Um, Troy, we lost your sound. 
Hello? Yeah. There, now you're back. Yep, you're good. Oh, I must have, must have done that while I was typing. Sorry. Okay. So, so you're about to summarize author's craft. Go. Right. So I, what I've done, I've just put a link to this over here in the, um, in the chat room. And what you'll see if you click on that link is basically a description of elements of author's craft um, that kind of fit into broad themes. Um, so I did make a nod to the Common Core, although I did not put it in the title of the book, which worked out good for me. <laughs> but I did talk about narrative, informational, and argumentative texts. And so kind of looking at the elements of craft that go into each of those three broad genres. And then also thinking a little bit about how um, different writing strategies and other different craft strategies might work. Like Ralph Fletcher, for instance, uses this idea of creating a hot spot in the writing and really expanding on that. And uh, Barry Lane talks about this idea of creating snapshots, something like that. So I created this list, got this all kind of organized. And then what I decided to do was um, push it a little bit further and say, well, what does author's craft look like in a digital age? And so I made a second list um, based on the readings that I've done and some exploration and just trying to figure out what teachers have been doing with their students in their classrooms. And this is a list I call additional elements of author's craft for digital writing. And specifically, it looks at website design, audio text, presentations and video text. And it gives a, a few other things that you might want to consider. So for instance, we're going to be jumping into presentations here really quickly. So some of the other additional considerations that you might want to think about would be the slide design and layout, including fonts, colors, shapes, the design, um, using information graphics or infographics to represent data in different forms of charts and graphs and data visualizations. And also thinking strategically about how to use images, including the size, the orientation, whether or not it has watermarks on it, whether or not you should get your own original image or use one you found on the internet and so forth. So I just wanted to introduce those ideas in the broad categories of author's craft and uh, help that uh, spark our conversation and move it forward. And hi, Monica. Nice to see you. <laughs> Monica, uh, Troy's uh, in, in Colorado right now, so you guys might not be far away, but <laughs> oh, see you. Um, great. So where do we want to go from here? Let's go. Oh, I, I had a question, and let's see if other people have questions for Troy, even at this point, if that mm -hmm. seems fair. Um, I, the, the, the first list of, the, of authors' craft, was that based on like published authors? And then your list, was that based more on students? Was that maybe a difference? Or did you all actually look at what grown-ups do, too? <laughs> well, uh, I'll be honest. I didn't necessarily look at what grown-ups do in that sense. The, the first list came from what I've come to know and understand about this term author's craft. Um, anybody who's been a part of the writing project or at all familiar with the work of Lucy Calkins, Nancy Atwell, Ralph Fletcher, that kind of general history of people who teach writing will hear this term like author's craft um, or craft elements or even sometimes they're called strategies or approaches or something like that. But so, these are things that authors do in their writing to make their writing work. So for instance, so, having an effective lead. Oh, yeah, I was going to ask for examples. And if I just shut up, you'll tell me. Go ahead. <laughs> so some examples of having an effective lead. What else? Oh, sure. Um, you know, so like in narrative, um, just looking at this list for narrative, like having a point of view, having effective characters, having a, a reliable or perhaps an unreliable narrator, um, creating a setting or a scene, adding dialogue, using flashback, flash forward. So just a list of like the general um, characteristics of author's craft in those different genres. That's where the first list came from. Cool. Okay. Yeah. So any I, other I, thoughts? Any anybody want to throw anything at Troy right now? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so uh, I guess I, I just want to invite larger conversations. So it's not just people presenting. I mean, not that that's not bad but, or good <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> but a little dialogue would be great too. 
So l let me ask, let me put it this way then. Andy and Aaron, um, but do you think about these things, these uh, kinds of lists when you build curriculum, or how, how does that integrate into your thinking as a teacher? That's, that seems like a fair, in general. Yeah, absolutely. I was um, actually going to ask Troy a question. Troy, Good. when you were kind of working through the process of creating um, your book and then collecting examples, what was the biggest difference that you saw from like the elementary level to the middle school and secondary level as far as like what presentation tools um, were most beneficial, but then like what craft was being utilized at the different levels as well? I would say the biggest difference, <laughs> this is actually kind of interesting. I think the the younger elementary examples, like there was one I got an ebook from Amber Kowach here in um, Ludington, Michigan. Well, actually back home in Ludington, Michigan. I'm in Colorado right now. But um, she, you know, had her students write the story and then they also illustrated the book and then they turned it into an ebook. So it was a completely original creation, nothing necessarily gotten from the internet in terms of additional outside pictures or anything like that. And, you know, with your examples from your students and also with Andy's, very good examples from middle school and high school, but the it seemed like the, the work of those examples was more in the text that was being created, and especially with Andy's Prezi, because I believe those students were also doing some literary essays and so forth. So in the Prezi that we'll look at, you'll see that They've created a lot of text and then brought in images and things from other sources without actually creating those um, on their own. And, and I don't know that that was necessarily part of the assignment either, so I'm not criticizing it. I just noticed that as a difference. I, I find it interesting that um, we really are, you know, it seems like the younger the kids are, the more they're creating their own things to make digital or creating them digitally in the first place. I kind of have a follow-up question to that. One of the things that mm -hmm. I notice, especially with my kids, because my kids are in elementary school, my son will be entering fourth grade and my daughter will be entering second grade, and um, I just noticed that it seems like technology and, and there's more um, teachers allowing students to kind of write that way and, and write the way they want and come up with their own things. And as I see it progress through middle school and high school, maybe it's just the district that I teach in, but I see that happening less and less as though we have, you know, we have to teach towards the test and we have to get kids ready for college. And I just wonder if sometimes kids get bored with the same old thing. Like, I, why did I move to present, for example? Um, part of it is that kids have been doing PowerPoint since first grade. Now, it's not so much about the PowerPoint, it's, but it is about the presentation that you're coming up with. So the more options we can have, then it, gets, it excites kids a little bit more. I kind of feel like some students, especially by the time they reach 12th grade, which is primarily what I teach, have kind of done the same things over and over and over again, which is why I wanted to dabble a little bit with this um, idea of coming up with a visual argument instead of having kind of handwritten or typed arguments all the time as well. I don't know if you could talk about that a little bit, Troy. I'm actually going to rely on you for some of that. I think that um, what you're doing with your students Part of the reason I chose it for the book is because it's really smart work. You're, you're not just having them create a presentation. You're actually having them use the presentation as a way to work through their thinking for the literary essay mm -hmm. and so that they can be coherent as they're making their presentation to this large group. It's not just standing up and saying, oh, we read Macbeth wasn't that great. Uh, here's this, this, and this. But they're actually following a logical sequence pattern of ideas. So um, I'd like to say that I'm seeing that more and more as we see more and more of these tools out there. Um, I think that, you know, I've seen many examples where, you know, say kids create a script and then they put it into extra normal or go animate or something like that and you watch a short little cartoon and unfortunately it, it the script doesn't do justice to the topic at hand. Like it's great that the kids were thinking about it and they're trying something different, but the then you have like these little animated figures talking to each other and it doesn't always come off as 
um, sophisticated, I guess, or even as smart as perhaps what the kids were thinking. Like they, they put some, maybe they did put some really good thought into having a debate, but then you have cartoon characters having a debate and it just it doesn't quite work out that well. So I think we're I like, still kind of in the midst of all of it. I, I like to think in 10 years when somebody looks at this, they're going to say, ooh, that was when they were making those things. <laughs> you know what I mean? So these tools kind of move on in some way. But I, so, which I'm wondering, Troy, do you think there's an argument in your book? <laughs> well, I certainly hope so. Um, <laughs> you know, as an academic, I would make the case that in K-12 writing instruction, um, we should be moving towards intentional craft of digital text. It's not just about the tools. It's not just that you can make an Animoto or that you can sign into VoiceThread or that you can use wiki spaces. The fact is you can and those are great tools and those tools allow certain types of thinking and writing to happen and that's the kind of thoughtful smart things that we need to be doing with kids in classrooms. So, so I'm wondering if we could transition and look at some of those things that um, both Andy and Aaron have had their students doing. Um, Andy, I noticed you had a link to your Prezi in there. Do you, do you want to go ahead and um, talk about that first, and you can use screen sharing too if you'd like. Yeah, let's try it. Unless you're okay. let's, let's try if it. you're if Thank you're you. ready to. But introduce a little more first. If you don't mind. Okay. Well, um, and the, this is this is work you did with seniors. Is that right? Yes, I happen to do this with an advanced placement group of seniors. But I think one thing I should say about um, um, where I teach and what I teach is I kind of teach I teach a lot of different things. I teach advanced placement. I teach general general education students. Um, I also have a master's degree in emotional impairments and behavior and learning disorders as well. So I've, I'm a special educator. I'm a general educator. I'm an AP teacher. I, I, I kind of my experience are vast and varied. And I think it's important to point that out because a lot of times when I'm giving presentations and I talk about being an advanced placement teacher and this comes from that type of class, immediately I hear a lot, I see a lot of people sort of respond, well, well those are AP kids. So that's, that's why you can get away with doing that kind of thing. And I don't necessarily think that's the case. I think it's the way that we present it and how we try to uh, help our students meet with success regardless of what level they're at. And the type of help that we can have, especially using our digital writing workshop, I think helps out a lot because you can get that one-on-one -on -one with students that they wouldn't necessarily have. And for this particular assignment, um, it's an assignment where we're studying Shakespeare, getting ready for literature and composition um, test later on, but it's not all teaching to the test. I like to provide students with a lot of different choices. Um, and one of the choices is they can study uh, King Lear, or they can study Macbeth and they can do these separately. So they might be doing both of these at the same time in different groups of about oh four to five people, sometimes six if it if it gets if people are really passionate about studying a certain play. And then what I what I've done those, is I've those are self selected or how do you Yes, I have them self select which play that they want to study. And then as we as we study the play, we do some of the reading out of it, but most of it we watch all the videos as to kind of give get some background for us. Um, the videos, what do you mean? We watch, there's a, there's a video um, from PBS from Macbeth. I think it has Ian McKellen in it. Mm -hmm. I might be getting it mixed up. I think King okay, Lear has yeah, yeah. Ian McKellen in it and um, Macbeth has um, Patrick Stewart in it. So um, in order to do that in about six weeks, because I don't want to make this a never-ending sort of a project, we spend the time kind of analyzing it the way that, that the play is presented um, in video. I also believe that plays are meant to be experienced. They're not meant to be just sort of read out of a text and kind of a round-robin sort of a style. So it's another reason why I've chosen to, to go that route. Um, many of the things that, that I do within, within this come from the work of Jim Burke. Uh, Kelly Gallagher also comes from Penny Kittle as well, uh, and I, I've kind of combined some of those ideas together. Once students get into groups and they figure out what they want to do, they're offered not only just the choices of these two plays, but also there's nine different critical theories that I want them to look at. Uh, some of the theories are like a uh, philosophical or existential point of view, um, psychological or analytical point of view, Students can look at things from a mythological or archetypal uh, point of view. 
Um, and in the case that you'll see tonight, students can look at things from a feminist or a cultural point of view as well. So I want students to have a lens in which they're going to be viewing the play, and the lens is the critical theory. They, do, they spend some time studying the critical theory itself, so they become sort of mini experts in that to really sharpen that focus for themselves. Once they have that figured out, then they begin to view the play itself um, through that lens as they're trying to answer one inquiry type question that they develop on their own. Andy, can I ask about about that lens um, business? <laughs> for sure. Put it that way. The, um, is, is there a moment before they use that lens when they, you know, just have their own personal gut reaction to the work? Um, actually, okay. yep. More um, cut, if yeah. you look at the chat room, I have uh, the second link, which is, I'm sorry, the first link, which is the longer link, is a link to the Google Doc that is pretty much the whole project itself that students get to see. And part of that has the, I saw in a text, I thought, kind of T-chart kind of an idea. Uh, mm -hmm. So they kind of work it through themselves as well. Hmm. Cool. Um, let's see. So as they're, as they're kind of working their way through this, we take, we take time. Um, we also use Cornell Notes, where students write down their observations based on the inquiry question they have. In the case of this particular project, the students came up with, how does Lady Macbeth defy gender role conventions of her time? So looking at this feminine, feminist approach, because she seems to be um, a type of character that's really not fitting the role that was, that was in the society at the time that uh, Shakespeare wrote the play. And so they kind of explore that idea through there. It really helps to focus because, I don't know, my, maybe, maybe my students are different, but I, I doubt it. Uh, many AP students are trying to know everything they need to know about everything when it comes to the literature. And when you do that with Shakespeare, you can over overwhelm yourself very quickly. And so having the one question kind of helps with that. Um, so as, as they're exploring that, part of what I ask them to do is take notes using Cornell Notes, uh, keep track of these things with T-charts. They um, daily converse about and, and dialogue with each other about what they're noticing. Um, I ask them to put stars by the things that are, seem to be the most important parts, um, pull out quotes that are things that should be uh, talked about, and they, they do talk about these things. And then as they, uh, as they get near the end, they begin to develop an answer to the question, how does Lady Macbeth defy gender role conventions of her time? Andy, sorry to interrupt again, but okay. thank you for letting me do that. Um, is there another example of a, of a question you can think of? Uh, kids use. Or am I throwing you off? If I am, we can keep you going. You throw me off a bit, but that's okay. I, th then never mind. <laughs> and, and go ahead. We'll, right. we'll, we'll keep that for later. Go ahead. The questions are, I mean, they're not something that I have as, like, stock questions. They're the questions that students come up with. So, uh -huh. honestly, it's been, what, about maybe six months or so since I've last done this project, so it's kind of escapes my memory. Um, That's fair. Yeah. I just, so, I'll just keep it for later. Go ahead. Okay. Um, what, I'd like, what I'd like students to do as they're exploring this, though, I think exploring it in writing is good because we, we, we write to learn, and I understand that. But I think, too, there's some visual aspects to our learning process as well. And if we, can, if we use Prezi, the way that I ask students to use it, where they take the most important quotes, they write down their ideas, they start to bring in images, they start to incorporate music and look at lyrics as poetry. Um, it begins to, students begin to think about this whole idea of, in this case, feminism with Macbeth and, and Lady Macbeth in a different light. As they're going through their argument visually, they're working together. And Prezi is another nice thing for that because it's a collaborative type of an approach. So instead of working with PowerPoint, we have to have basically one person doing it. You can have everybody working on the assignment at once, which is strange for students at first, but then they begin to get used to it because information doesn't get lost that way. And then they really actually have a chance to decide, why wow, do we really need this in our presentation or do we not need this in our presentation? Um, Andy, we, we just had to say hi to somebody. Oh, Aaron, you got to put him in the lower third, i got to say. <laughs> right. Welcome. Sorry to interrupt you again, Andy. Oh. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, <laughs> this, this What's your name? 
Can say your name. I'm Jacob. Hi, Jacob. Hi, Jacob. I'm five. Cool. Nice to have you here. Welcome. Back to you, Andy. All right. Um, this particular project kind of has has a lot of moving parts, so it's sort of hard to just describe um, orally like this. You're doing great. I yeah, and you're even letting us interrupt you. So go ahead. Okay. Um, let's see where is I at. Oh, so as students work their way through the presentation, one of the things that I ask them to do is I want I tell them that their presentation should enhance what they say and not be what they say. So there'll be there'll be some instances where they have things that are what exactly what they want to say, but most of those are quotes from the play that helps to uh, help to add credence to their argument that they're making, um, coming up with the answer to the question. In this case, uh, does Lady Macbeth defy gender role conventions of the time? Um, and so, so they are using these prezies in a in a presentation, an actual in class presentation. Yes, it's an actual in-class presentation, but it's really more of a way for them to kind of solidify the argument in their own minds because they're working together as a group. That's one of the end products. The other end product is they have a, a group essay that they write as well, a group argument essay, where they're using the things that they've found within uh, their presentation to uh, write it up that way too. Mm -hmm. um, so as they go through the process, I, I try to throw something else in differently because I want them to begin to think um, di uh, divergent, using divergent thinking. And so I ask them to try to find, I want to show them that what they see in Shakespeare's plays, the reason why it's still valuable is because it's part of what the human existence is all about. So I ask them to find a couple scenes in particular that seem to be turning points that really uh, show, in this case, feminism in action. And I asked them to match that up with some classic works of art from the play that depict that scene and create uh, short little videos that have a song that's a contemporary song that seems to show as well feminism from this point of view and show how it sort of matches up or doesn't match up uh, with what was happening within the play with Lady Macbeth. That becomes part of the presentation that does a couple things for students. I don't want students to think that they have to necessarily be up and speaking all the time when they present. Every once in a while, it's nice to set something up, allow the audience to see it in action, what they've discovered, in this case using classical artwork and uh, contemporary music, and then share their, their input or their decision-making um, reasoning for adding that in there. Um, when it comes to the end, they do have an answer that they share with us, which is basically their argument. Uh, we, we get to see that visually. And once we see that, it uh, really helps to shed new light on what it is that students and how students interpreted this play. It really does become their work. It's not just something that is um, kind of spit out from something that they found um, elsewhere online for Macbeth or for King Lear. And one of the reasons that I really like, I was trying to find authentic audiences, okay? So to try to do two different plays, I do that because those students who are, are doing Macbeth, let's say, they become the experts for Macbeth, the experts for that critical lens, and they teach that play and a way of looking at that play to the students who have been studying King Lear. And the students who have been studying King Lear do the same thing for the students who are studying Macbeth. Now, I don't just have two groups. I may have six groups in a class. So we may see different versions of not just the plays, but also different lenses in which students view the plays as well which really at the end of it gives a whole really wide perspective on this human experience that we can find settled right within uh, the two plays by Shakespeare and it provides students with um, good insight especially in an AP class to think about you know it's, there's not always one right answer in fact that's usually not the case it's what is your answer and how did you get to that spot I want to welcome Beth by the way <laughs> hi guys hi, um, so, Andy, how, how long have you, how many years um, have you been doing this project with young people, and has it changed over time? Um, I've done it twice. Okay. So, um, I think the only thing that's, the one thing, the major thing that's changed is now I begin the unit by having um, I have a professor friend of mine from Central Michigan University, uh, Chris McDermott, who is the who's the Shakespeare professor over there, mm -hmm. and I have her come in 
um, to do some interviews with my students before we begin. So she, they get to talk sp specifically about a critical lens they want to look at and specifically about the play that they're looking at as a group. And she can provide a lot of insight and kind of, it, they bounce their ideas off her, the expert in the field, and it really helps them to really feel like they're on the right page with things. And I find that's that was really useful having Chris come in and kind of help out help out with that and for multiple reasons. And when you bring a college professor into a high school, you have someone who's an expert in the field who's written many articles and some texts about that as well. Um, and it gives the students a way of feeling comfortable that yeah, what they're saying is actually worthwhile and of interest to people beyond just the classroom itself. So did you want to try to show one or do you know if that's going to work? See, I've used like some. Well, we have, I, I've put a number of links from in the in chat, the and those will go up here with it. But right. Maybe, maybe I'm, show I'm one. also curious. Do you want to move well, on? Okay. I can yeah, move. and I'm a, I'm actually going to interrupt because I want Andy to put a different link in here if at all possible. There, there's a little bit of chat going on about how uh, students can craft effective nonfiction texts. Um, that use digital elements, and so there, I mentioned Snowfall from the New York Times, and I know Andy, you had your students do some projects earlier in the spring, so maybe you could catch up on the chat room on uh, edtechtalk.com slash ttt, and then um, we can come back to you as we get closer to the end. So thank you so much for explaining all that. And uh, Beth, we're going to let you get uh, oriented just a few minutes more here. Okay. We're going to let Erin talk a little bit about some of her student projects and um, how she helps students um, uh, move beyond traditional PowerPoints. And then Beth will have you talk about your digital essay project. Sounds good. Thanks. So Erin. So the students that I work with were a little bit younger. Um, they were in middle school. I worked with sixth and seventh graders. And the situation in the middle school is a little bit unique in that there were two of us that we were co-teaching in our position. And um, the guy that I was co-teaching with, Rex, he had been teaching for a number of years and was very comfortable um, in his instruction, his methodologies. And we were partnered. Um, so that he could help mentor me as a new teacher, but then also so that I could help him integrate uh, more technology into his curriculum. So he, um, we ended up becoming really good friends, and he was very open with being nervous about incorporating such technologies into his classroom, and he was not afraid to admit that he has been doing the same exact thing in the same exact lesson for a number of years, and it worked for him. So why change? But then once he kind of saw um, what was out there and available um, in regards to digital writing and the opportunities that lent itself for kids to develop amazing projects, he, he wanted to learn more. And he was really thankful that uh, we were kind of doing it together. Um, so it was kind of a win-win for the both of us. And one of the first projects that Rex and I did was um, a project with the Titanic. And that's what Troy included in his book. And uh, let's see if I can do a screen share with you guys so you can see. You did screen share, now you need to find the screen. Do you know what we mean by that? Okay, are you guys able to see my screen? We see one of your screens. Um, you'll, have, you'll have more than one window open and you need to look to find the window that you want to show. Uh, I love that infinity thing that happens. <laughs> Keep seeing yourself forever and ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, do you know do you know what we're trying to do? Let's Yeah, it's not the, the screen. No, the screen share is correct. You did the right thing there. Then you need to to move your um, windows around and find the window that that you want to show us. There's more than one window open on your desktop. We can wait. Yeah. There's a million. <laughs> oh well. Which you're you're trying to show the Titanic. There, there you go. You're there. Right right. You're close. You had one of them there. There you go. <laughs> That's one. All right. Are you able to see it now? We are able to see, yes, I think so. Just, this is the Glockster. Yeah, we so have I'll scroll down to it. So. There you go. Okay. Correct. 
So the Glogster is on the left, and this was a project created um, by Hunter. And I guess what I should explain first is the students were given choice. It wasn't, we're going to um, do a project and you're going to create a presentation and um, you all have to use Glogster. So the students were actually, um, let me see if I can pull it up really quick for you. Aaron, the link in so people can click on it too. Thank you. Can you see um, the document that I have pulled up? We lost screen share. Yeah, um, you're not going to be able to show a document that's uh, pulled up like oh. that. <laughs> Why don't we just talk yeah. about it? I think we're going to yeah, have to do fine. that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the students and, were And on. there are links that we can get to. Yeah, right, thanks. definitely. So the students were given choice um, a variety of different projects that they could create. Um, they could have done a Glogster project. They could have done... Um, they could have done a Prezi, they could have done um, a Storybird project, an extra normal where the characters were animated. So this particular student decided to do a Glogster. And with the digital writing assignment, there were um, requirements in, in regards to the amount of writing that the students were required to do. And then as far as um, the type of multimedia pieces that they were expected to pull into their project. So um, Hunter has a video displayed and then several graphic images and then all of his writing. Um, a lot of the students that Rex and I were working with in this class um, were, were beautiful writers, um, but they were what you would consider your reluctant writers. So when they were given, um, I think choice was the biggest uh, opportunity for them to kind of be empowered in their writing. So they weren't told that it had to be a pencil and paper, um, but that they could type it, they could incorporate their own style and their own voice through multimedia. They really just got to work. And we were able to see some dynamic writing that we had never seen out of some of these students before. And that just the collaboration that sparked between the kids, working back and forth with each other and sharing ideas. And they were digging deeper into research, which was something that Rex and I did not originally anticipate. So they were not only just looking in the books that we had provided and then some of the basic internet resources, but they were even coming into school the next day with, you know, DVDs and, and different um, print articles that they had printed off from home or in the library before school and just different resources that they collected and they were excited to share it with their friends in class and look what I found and did you know this and I mean they were really just doing their thinking on a higher level, comparing at, um, all of the facts and putting things in order and timelines and they were talking about different interviews from some of the survivors and it was just really interesting the level of engagement um, just providing them with a with choice and then giving them the creative outlet to kind of display their learning in any any medium that they wanted to so Hunter uh, did a really great job doing his Glogster and you can see um, the font's kind of small, but like Troy said, he provided the links for you. And Troy, Troy showed it as you were talking, and we got that on the video. So, Oh, perfect. Thank you very yes. much. <laughs> so what are some of the other things they chose? Um, I'm not sure if you can still see my screen or not, but I'll kind of talk about some of them. One of the girls, she decided to do a story bird, which is a digital storybook, and you're provided with um, a variety of different artwork that you can choose from on the website. It's just storybird.com. So what the student students would do is they would go onto this website and they would select artwork from a particular artist. And then from that artwork that they selected, you're given many different um, examples that you can pull for the different pages of your book. And then you can kind of create um, a realistic type fiction story or whatever you want to go with the artwork. So Jamie, one of the girls, created this beautiful fictional story that of course was based on the Titanic, but she kind of tweaked some of the characters. The protagonist was a little bit different. So, But I mean, the rising action and everything was the same, but she incorporated uh, a lot of what Troy was that, talking about. That was a very um, interesting thing you just said about the Titanic, but go ahead. The rising action. But go. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry to notice. <laughs> See, um... Uh, <laughs> she was. Like, she did a, a really nice job um, incorporating just dialogue, and it was really interesting just the way that she painted a picture um, through her story. And this is someone 
who had never expressed um, creative writing in this way before. So we were really proud of the work that she had that she had done, and um, we actually partnered with one of the elementary classrooms as well, so that some of the students who did the story birds could share their stories with some of the elementary classrooms. My daughter at the time was in first grade, so it was really easy to do that partnership. Um, another, some of, some of the other students decided to do uh, an extra normal project, and this was one um, boy who had come up to me, and he said, uh, Mrs. Klein, I don't really like any of the project choices that you offered to us. And he said, can I do something different? And I was like, well, absolutely. What did you have in mind? And he said, well, I don't know. I kind of want to do a project where um, I write a script between two characters as if they're doing a newscast and they're telling um, about the Titanic sinking as if it were happening right then. And I thought that that sounded really interesting. And I said, why don't you draft something up and put it on paper, and then I'll see if I can find um, a website for you. And of course, I had Extra Normal in mind, but I wanted to see what he would come up with. And he, he did a really, really nice job. So that was um, another project idea that one of the students had done, was taking an, an Extra Normal. <laughs> That's called multimedia. <laughs> cool. Beth, do you want to jump in and introduce yourself, and we'll we'll catch up with Erin again. Hi, everyone. Right. Sorry, I'm late. I'm Beth Nelson, and I teach at Greenville High School, which is in Greenville, Michigan, which is right about here. <laughs> and um, okay. I uh, did a digital essay with my AP yep. students. Okay, Beth. Let's uh, let's throw back to Aaron, I guess. Aaron, are you ready? You good? Yeah, sorry about that. My husband. No problem. Some softball. <laughs> the uh, extra normal has has dog sounds in it now. Uh, that's good. I'm sorry. What was that? <laughs> Does extra normal have dogs in it now? That's where you were. You were talking about extra normal. Right. I just didn't hear your question. Does it have what? I'm, I'm sorry. Dog sounds. The dog. sounds. The barking. Never mind. Oh, I'm just trying to be funny. I'm, I'm not. I'm not pulling it off very well. <laughs> Go ahead. No, you are. You are. You are. It's like I hear the scattering feet as they're running away from the hardwoods into the other room. So sorry okay. about that. Um, so so extra, extra normal, normal debate. Yeah. Yeah. Was one that um, one of the students had done, and then uh, let's see. Another one was a really interesting project. Um, when I originally had given the students choice, I wanted to give them some ideas as far as what technology to choose. So I kind of divided up on the document just some ideas for them to provide some direction or framework for them to get started. And I had suggested to them if you know they were kind of apprehensive with getting started with technology and expressing their um, or using a presentation um, in a multimedia fashion, then they might want to start off with something kind of simple like a story bird. But if they were kind of um, tech savvy, they might want to do something like a blogster. But if they were pretty comfortable with technology, they might want to try and develop their own website and do a Weebly website and incorporate many of these different elements into it. Or they might want to try something like a capsules project. And I had a, a couple of students in the class kind of differentiate um, on their own and just decided to do a full blown out website and incorporate a story bird into it. A, Blogster into it, so they really just kind of took it to a different level. But um, one of the students created a capsules project, which is a digital timeline, and he had put um, he had written all of his uh, writing into Word documents into different paragraphs, and then he chunked them in this timeline as to where where they would fall in sequence. So he has many different images. Um, in his project that he had found to tell his story and then he kind of just added in his digital writing throughout the composition and he was able to embed this directly onto the website that he had created too. So that was um, another project idea was capsules. So Aaron? Yes. Um, we want to make sure we leave enough room for Beth here in the show but so but are there other important points to make? Um, I, I think just once Rex and I kind of rolled this out with this project, um, we didn't really have to teach any of the technology tools. Of course, the kids um, kind of understood and got that. But once we did this project and allowed choice and introduced the different tools to them, um, we did this at the beginning of the year. So throughout the uh, rest of the year, it was really interesting because 
they they started asking us, can we do um, a Glogster? And this might have been a partnership that it, or an individual who had previously done a Storybird or a Capsule. So they were wanting to try different tools on their own. Um, and we didn't have to kind of set it up at all for them. They just knew that these are the tools available. And if I need um, further information, I can seek out my, my friend in class who, who's used this before. So the kids were really taking on leadership roles and, and helping each other and facilitate um, kind of a, a teacher type role. It was really interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Beth, do you want to jump back in? Thanks so sure. much, Aaron. And sure. I hope we have some time for questions and back and forth a little bit here. But go ahead, Beth. Okay. So I did a digital essay that I, I basically stole from Jim Burke off of his uh, English companion Ning. And what I really liked about it is that it really fit seamlessly with what I was trying to do with my uh, AP students anyways, and that was to get them to really become more engaged in writing uh, about literature. And what I had found in the past is that a lot of the writing that they were doing was just regurgitating what somebody else had already said, and I really wanted them to become more authentic writers. So I thought this might be the way to go. And the first time that I approached this assignment, um, I kind of rolled it all out at once, and, and they got really engaged with all of the, um, the links that they could add, and their writing was terrible. It was terrible writing, and the links that they had were really superficial. Lots of video links and things, and none of it really made any sense together. And so the way that I approached it the second time is that I had them do the writing all at once, had them write the essay and then thought about it as a layered piece of writing and considered what layers would lead them further and had them think about um, you know what what questions would would a reader have as they're as they're looking at that essay and where could they put some links and where could they put some some things to lead them further into um, some of their ideas and some of the bigger themes and one of the the big themes that I was really trying to address was the relationship between style and theme as they were looking at literature and so I was trying to mirror that with their writing as well and I thought this was a really good way to do that because there's so much stylistic um, opportunity when you're doing anything that's digital and layered and um, looking at just the artistry of where do you put a link and how does it look on a page and so that's how I approached it this last year and I think I got better results doing it that way um, both with the links that they put in and the actual writing because I think that they did a lot more revision um, what part of the assignment was they had to read a self-selected story that was either a novel or a play that was a Nobel Prize winning author or a Pulitzer Prize winning author and so I had students writing about Moby Dick um, and surprisingly that was one of the best essays that I read. Um, I had students writing about atonement, um, Anna Karenina, lots of lots and lots of different types of um, novels and plays and what was interesting is that the links then were very different. Um, you know, the student that wrote about Moby Dick found places where there was some humor in there and added that into some of the links that she chose. And so it was, it was interesting. And where were they publishing this, these essays? Um, they were publishing these on my Classroom Wiki page. For each, I have a digital portfolio um, as part of the Classroom Wiki, and so each student has their own page, and so they were publishing them on their own page on my classroom wiki. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. I mean, unless there's more to add there. Um, shall we try to ask each other some questions and lead sure. up into some yeah. conversation? Or, Troy, is there something in the chat room to bring back here? or? The, there is something in the chat room, specifically a question to Aaron, but I want to follow up on something that Beth sure. just said, so let me toss the question out for Aaron. How has your digital writing instruction changed now that you're teaching second grade, so making that shift from middle school to second grade? And then, Beth, I think that phrase that you just used a few moments ago, the artistry of the digital layers, mm -hmm. um, 
I wonder if you could all talk about that a little bit, because one of the themes that um, I guess I expressed in the book more than I thought I had, because in our summit um, a couple weeks ago, people were saying, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And that <laughs> kind of became a little catchphrase mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. my book. And yes, kids can put bells and whistles and links and images and music and all this great stuff, but they shouldn't necessarily do it. So maybe each of you could talk just really briefly, like 30 seconds or so, thinking about what, what are the important elements of crafting digital writing? What, what makes it this digital artistry for all of you? Um, I'll just jump in real quick. I, I think that one of the things that I'm thinking about, and, and I've been thinking about it as I go into this next year, is the idea of how digital literacy is also very much visual literacy and I'm thinking about using even picture books as kind of a, a gateway into talking about the artistry of it so that's probably one of the ways that I wanna think about approaching it for next year um, and I really liked one of the things that Jim Burke said about how he would take one slide and he would talk about the placement of things and and where he would put what kind of font he would use and what size and where he would place a picture and I've done that assignment with my with my students also as a way of them thinking about um, the artistry. So that's just a couple of things that that I have in my mind when I think about the artistry. That that visual anything that's visual is somewhat artistry to me. So okay. thanks, Andy. Do you have something particular that you look for when you're looking at your students' digital writing? Things that uh, are particularly important for you. Well, I do. One, one, of the, one of the things I try to shift from, I think a lot of times in high school, at least at my high school, is English language arts has been turned into English language write an essay, which isn't always mm -hmm. the art thing. I think that arts gets forgotten about mm -hmm. a whole lot. And I think that's one of the reasons why I really like digital literacy is because we have that chance to bring the arts in, uh, whether it's the classic images that, we, that I have students use and purposely use in the Prezi, or it's bringing in um, um, music and audio as well, having them create their own little uh, mini mini digital movies as well. Um, you know, art, just like any other literature, is that mirror that we hold up to humanity that we can measure ourselves against what other people are doing. And when we think about that as from a digital point of view, that can't be forgotten about because you can't just throw something to get. Well, I should say you can just throw something together, but you really lose your punch, you lose your you lose your impact, and you lose your audience. Um, when you think about blogs that we have on, online, you think about other presentations, it's, yes, it's about what you have to say and it's about the beauty of your writing, but it's also about how you capture your attention of your audience, too. You know, it's, it's, you, you need that hook no matter what you do. And thinking about design, thinking about placement, thinking about font, like Beth had mentioned, all those things begin to come into place. But students don't really think about that and really teachers sometimes don't think about that either. And that, that bit of artistry, mm -hmm. It, it enhances what it is that you're saying and it draws that reader in just like you would with a hook for an introduction for an essay let's say but it's more from a visual multimodal medium well and, and, I, and I, I think too like what you're talking about when you want to talk about nuances in literature it's, it's a nice way to use visualization to, to get students to understand nuance as well right great well, Aaron, how about for you? What what has the shift been like going from middle school back to elementary, and and what are some of the very important parts of the craft of digital writing that are important to you? Um, you know, I honestly I think it's a little bit easier to do at the elementary level, especially at second grade. Um, I think that the children, seven and eight year olds, are insanely creative, so they don't they don't know what their expectations are. They just know what what they're supposed to do and they just try their very best so I think it's really easy at second grade um, you know if you read a really strong mentor text and the children they see that rich craft you know we read a lot of like Jonathan London books and hurricane stands out for one and once the children they hear that really rich dialogue or that show don't tell and they they want that I mean that's the type of author they are if you only provide them with rich literature that's the only style that they know um, so whenever you provide them with 
just the the highest level and the highest of quality of work. That's that's the expectation that they're going to rise to. So I don't know if um, teaching middle school kind of helped me keep a super high expectation, but not losing sight of what's developmentally appropriate for them either. But the children that I have, I'm very fortunate. Um, that they, I only have 15 of them, so I think having a small class size helps as well, that I am able to give a lot of personal attention. But the, the children that I have, they are readers. I mean, they go home and dive into books. They, any free time in class, that's what they're doing. But we do an equal amount of drawing and, and creative expression with, you know, paint and pen and clay. I mean, they build things in art class. and. Our children at our school have a multimedia class as well, so they take digital photography, and I mean, they're learning about composition and placement and all of the different, uh, they know more about it than I do. Um, so being seven and eight and exposed to just such a, a wide variety of art form is, is impressive, and these kids take drama class, so I mean, they are creating their own scripts in drama class. They're on a big stage, and they're learning what it is to punctuate and to have um, a character voice, and then when they read in class and readers workshop, my my seven year olds have a beautiful storyteller's voice, so they know that whenever they're silent in their mind, but then they have um, their fingers to the keyboard or pencil in their hand, the art that they're creating and their expression, they're really incorporating everything that they're exposed to. So they have, um, you know, color. They have uh, my children add music to set the tone for their writing and their digital pieces as well, or they'll annotate their voice over it. So they're not only adding the visual components, but the written composition as well. And then a lot of times they'll either annotate or add music or something as well. So it's a really solid piece once they're done. Great, thank you. So, Troy, if you don't mind, I have a. A uh, quick question to ask everybody. <laughs> um, what's next for each of you in terms of uh, some of this work? What are, you, what are you looking forward to doing this fall? Well, I guess for me, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward in the second run for the Snowfall emulation project, using that as a mentor text. I think some of the examples that I shared online um, are kind of a good sort of college try, but I think we can, get, I think we can uh, do better. Um, one of the things that I'm going to be doing is working with, I'm fortunate enough in my school, do we have a tech center connected right to my high school? So I have a digital media uh, teacher that I'm friends with. So we're working on thinking about having his students look at the work that my students do and, and kind of work in tandem as they come up with a better sort of uh, digital, I guess uh, not digital story, but digital uh, multimodal kind of a project where more HTML can get kind of blended in and they can use the expertise of other students in a technical class and those students can kind of see the expertise of students in a literature class and help bring those ideas together. So I'm kind of excited to try that. Beth, what are you thinking? Well, I'm thinking that, you know, I've, I've worked really hard on, on the, them publishing and posting these things in their wiki site, but what I haven't done a really good job on and I'd like to really focus on next year is having my students looking at each other's work and commenting and blogging and questioning and making that become much more of a, a student-centered place versus a place that they're posting it for me to grade. And so that's mm -hmm. going to be my, um, my challenge for this next year. Is to get Very cool. Youthvoices.net. We'd love to have you. <laughs> Come on over. We can, we can play together. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, great. And Aaron, what are you thinking? Uh, per, just personal goals for my classroom. Um, I want to just add more diversity into their writing. I want to connect. Now that technology enables us to be able to kind of flatten our walls and connect with other classrooms across the globe, mm -hmm. my goal for my students, um, they're really well traveled. So I think it would be neat to kind of just connect them with classrooms across the globe and do some collaborative writing. Um, and and I, I don't know exactly what I have in mind with that, but just a, a lot of collaborative projects with just different different cultures from around the world. Because I, uh, second grade especially, we do families and communities for social studies. And I always like writing across the curriculum and, and different content areas. So I'd like to be able to tie in, even though we do families and communities for social studies, we talk a lot about the different cultures and the way that we study our own family and our own community is by comparing the similarities and differences with other 
cultures um, around the world. So I think it would be neat to do some sort of fictional and nonfiction type writing um, with other schools and other classrooms. It's interesting how similar your three answers were. <laughs> What's next? At least I'm hearing it. That's that is really interesting. Cool. Great. Troy, you have any kind of wrap up for us here? Or? <laughs> I would just say that there's been some really great conversation in the chat room. Thanks to Peggy for putting all of the links over on the Titan pad. And um, Sherry is here thinking about her, her last comment was, I'm trying to move our school's thinking in this direction, this direction of uh, crafting digital things, doing, making, thinking. Think how much thinking is involved in deciding the components, the design, artifacts, and digital writing. So. Um, and she's like, uh, oh, and she also just gave you all a shout out. Love these reflective mm -hmm. teachers. They're, they're <laughs> so privileged to have them, which I would agree too. And um, I, I think that everyone tonight has really spoken to that key theme of intention and craft. And um, I know Andy put a link to Ken Robinson's book over there, and we started last week talking about Ken Robinson. So maybe that's an interesting point to end on this idea that as long as we're intentional and using the technology in ways that uh, really enhance meaning making, then um, kids are going to be able to craft some pretty incredible pieces. The last thing that I would just throw out there is that um, this week, the Pew Internet and the National Writing Project released a survey called uh, The Impact of Digital Tools on Student Writing and How Writing is Taught in Schools. I have not had a chance to read through all of it yet, but um, it does look like it's got some interesting statistics. And um, for instance, one is that's, saying that's that, your beach reading, Troy. I know. <laughs> no, I've got to got to find something else to read this week. Okay. But uh, <laughs> the fact that ninety six percent are. Uh, Allowing their student, digital technologies allow students to share work with a wider and more varied audience, which is something I think that everyone tonight has talked about in one way, shape, or form. So this is really seen in action what um, this Pew Internet and NWP survey says needs to be happening. So, so, and I want to thank them all for contributing uh, work to the book. So. Troy, your earlier book, the title is going to miss my, I'm going to forget it right now, and, and this most recent book are both on um, the, a, a wiki call, and can you tell us where to find that wiki? And yep. remind me of the first book again, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, the first book is called The Digital Writing Workshop, and this book is Digital Writing. The link is Digital Writing Workshop, all together, dot wikispaces dot com. And so if you start typing digital writing workshop, it'll probably come up in the top top few hits. These do feel like a nice pair, these two. Is that fair to say? Or or is it a trilogy and you're going to write a third one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's keep it a pair right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We'll see what happens with Heinemann. Maybe the, maybe the uh, finale will come out here in the, to the trilogy sometime <laughs> soon. No. Thank you for sharing it with us here on TTT. We really, really appreciate it. Um, and we're going to kind of sign off here in a, just a second. Um, as we do that, um, we always thank Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo, who set up this community at edtechtalk.com, um, which is a channel of the World Bridges Network. Um, you can also find this on YouTube, and you can find it um, at uh, teachersteachingteachers.org eventually. Um, so thank you all, and uh, we'll say goodnight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.